Web Marketing Networks Podcast, Episode 22. Welcome to the Web Marketing Networks Podcast. Come behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. Hello again, listeners. It is Adam Franklin from the Web Marketing That Works podcast, joined by my friend and co-host, Toby Jenkins. How are you, Tobes? Good, thanks, Ads. Hi, everyone. This is the show for people who love marketing on the web. Toby and I will take you behind the scenes of real-life marketing experiments and look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. We confess what's failed, and we reveal the truth about what really works. This show is brought to you by our new book, Web Marketing That Works, and specifically the bonus templates that go with it. So if you're keen to download the bonus 33 free templates, jump on over to our website, bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book, and you'll find them there. And the guest on today's show is Tim Martin from Net101. Cool. And so what are we exploring with Tim today then, Ads? Well, with Tim, we're going to dive into some of the things that have worked well for him and that haven't, and we're going to take a bit of a look at some of the, what I would call provocative marketing that he has done. It's also a reflection of his wicked sense of humor, which certainly appeals to me, um, but doesn't appeal to everybody, as we will discover in the show. Uh, so can we expect a little controversy in here then, can we? Yeah, a little bit of controversy and then maybe we'll have a bit of a chat later about how we would go about something in a similar situation. Sounds good. Let's get started. Sounds good. Hello, it's Adam Franklin and I'm here with Tim Martin. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Adam. Tim is a popular conference speaker and respected trainer through his Net 101 training sessions. Tim's also had a 15-year uh, career in digital marketing and social media, and he regularly presents to CEO groups on behalf of the Executive Connection. Now, I personally have known Tim for a number of years, and I'm a big fan of his no-fluff and sometimes provocative approach to marketing and social media. Now, Tim, I've mentioned a little bit about you there. Would you mind giving us a brief overview of your business and maybe some of the bits that I've missed out? Yeah, sure. Gosh, provocative. Am I provocative? I think so. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later in the interview. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, no, look, I, I think you've got it uh, mostly uh, there. Um, I am a trainer and educator. I, I did do consulting for a while um, and also had my own agency for a while, uh, building websites. Uh, that process I outsourced, but I did the marketing around them, the uh, search. Back then, it was mostly AdWords, which uh, went into um, – organic search, but I actually find it more interesting. I certainly find it more rewarding uh, financially and personally to train and educate, uh, not so much um, uh, provide solutions for people. I actually find the same there, Tim. We, we made a move just uh, just at the end of last year to move into advice an advice-only model, um, so you've, uh, you've, you've led the way there. Um, <laughs> Very good. Now, how would you explain your web marketing philosophy? Well, I think it's it's naturally unfolded over several years. I mean, I've gone down lots of uh, blind alleys, uh, but I've had enough time to work some things out. And uh, ironically, it started with the website, you know, uh, seven years ago, and that website is still the, the centerpiece of, of everything I do today. Um, social, uh, yes, uh, obviously I, I train in it um, and I'm active in it. But, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm quite um, adamant about is that you've got to be able to, um, you've got to be able to measure a result. You've got to be confident that you're getting a return on investment. And what I've been able to do through my website alone um, for the last few years and, and certainly standing here, or sitting here right now, um, that's been my, my, my greatest value generator. Now, you speak about a couple of uh, dead-end alleyways that you've been down. I think that's sort of par for the course for, for people in business like ourselves. Along, along this seven-year journey, what have been your major aha moments? Uh, look, I think, it, 
I think organic search would have to have been the big one for me. I mean, I, I started off in paid search. So I, I was probably one of the first advertisers ever to use the Google AdWords platform here in Australia. And I was quite smitten with it. I, the idea that you could get a, an ad up instantly, that you could um, you could target quite precisely and lead people to any part of the World Wide Web that you wanted them to go was extraordinary. Um, but that was back in the day where there wasn't a lot of competition, so you were able to to you know bid on keywords, you know down in you know certainly lower than a dollar, oftentimes around twenty thirty cents a click through. Those those days are long gone. Um, so I moved on from paid search and, and discovered the power of organic, and that was principally through my website, the ability to publish to the web, have that stuff be indexed uh, or called an indexed, and have pages from your website show up in results long after you'd originally pu- published the content. That, that was a big revelation to me. That's actually been um, something I've certainly appreciated in my journey too, Tim, the fact that you know you can, you can write something today and then it's still there next week, next month, next year, and Google will still pick it up and it'll still send traffic to, um, to it. People will read it and share it. And it really is the gift that keeps on giving. And you know, compared to even a Google ad, which was fantastic in the early days, and the idea of only paying if somebody clicks on it was great, but the fact is, you know, once somebody's clicked on it and you paid your money, you've got to reach into your own pocket or pull out your credit card again to get the next wave of traffic. And it it really makes it hard to build a sustainable asset, um, you know, compared to organic search results. Um, so totally, totally agree with you there. I um, I did actually end up going down the rabbit hole of, of you know, trying to understand how the algorithm worked. And, and there were some things you could do to gain the system. Um, I think we have all been into that dark space at some point. It's getting harder and harder to do these days. But but back then, you know, the algorithm wasn't sophisticated enough to pick up low-quality content. It was almost as easy as, as sprinkling a few, you know, strategically placed keywords around and it would do the trick. Now, I still see some organizations and individuals that are still back there that they think it's keyword-driven that they're not putting any emphasis on quality content, connecting with the customer, building up credibility, that sort of thing. And uh, it amazes me that that there are people out there still taking money off other people to do that sort of stuff. And thank goodness I think that things like Google authorship are now being introduced so that Google has an even clearer way to identify who the quality content creators are and to reward them appropriately. And it's no longer the um, the mud fight that, uh, you know, existed, you know, even just five years ago where you could be getting lots of backlinks from low quality directories or sprinkling keywords throughout your site and and um, and relying just purely on that. I'm so pleased to see that uh, Google's rewarding the quality of it because it does take time and a lot of effort these days. Uh, it certainly does. And, you know, that bring, brings me back to the website again. You know, the, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, there are places to publish content around the web, but there's no better place than your own website or your own blog. Um, so to have that platform, to have that content marketing publication machine, uh, you know, really should be the centerpiece of of anybody's online uh, marketing. Now, Tim, the second part of this Web Marketing That Works podcast is where we look at marketing experiments, and I like to delve into the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, let's start off with the good. What (laughs) What have you tried that's worked well? Uh, what have I tried this week? Well, I think um, I think nothing worked for me particularly well first up. You know, I'd give things a go, like I'd give a blog a go and I'd give Twitter a go when it first came out and, and maybe I didn't understand it fully, but it, it just didn't seem to do anything. It didn't seem to sort of give you any return. Um, and then you, you know, read a few books and you listen to some podcasts and you, you hear stories about people that are making it work. But, of course, they've done it because they've been persistent and they've refined uh, uh, the way that they approach it again and again. So I, I think just about everything I've done first up has, has been a failure, to, to be honest. Uh, some things have persisted through and other things, you know, that I've tried building a community in Second Life, for example. Uh, that certainly didn't work. <laughs> now, that's going back a few years Am I dating myself now? <laughs> well, I was there too. Yeah, gosh, I, I never saw you. I saw a lot of other weird people, but uh, I never never bumped into you, Adam. <laughs> now, how about the bad? What's what's failed, and and what have you learned from that experience? I 
I tried some some traditional offline marketing. It's really weird. I I don't think I was ever a classical marketer in the sense of you know running um, offline campaigns for a company. Um, but it's still that tendency to think that there's something in it. And and ironically, you know, as an online marketing person, a digital uh, uh, specialist, that. I was drawn to, to this flame of wanting to try offline marketing and, and run some ads in a newspaper or run a radio campaign or whatever, and, and they were just complete failures. They super expensive. I, I, I'm pretty sure I got nothing back for it, I, and I, I wouldn't even know whether I did or not because there was no way really to measure it. Um, so I, I think I'm going to stick to things that I know. I, I'll be honest, I do not understand how offline marketing works. I understand how offline relationship building works, but the idea of hiring space uh, on page eight of a newspaper and paying money for that, it, it's just a deep mystery to me. And Tim, how about uh, the ugly? This is confession time. Have you had any dead set shockers? Well, I did send a newsletter out recently that uh, caused people to cancel my course. So <laughs> that could be a, uh, a shocker. Um, Do you want to tell us more about that? Well, you, you used the P word provocative before and you know, my position is that uh, social and online is, is a great way to express yourself and, and, and let a bit of personality shine through. Um, the, so the question then is, what would that personality look like? And, and some people would say, well, that's a brand position. But, you know, one of my uh, brand values is to try and be um, fun, uh, to try and um, be a little uh, bit mysterious, uh, provocative, if you will. Um but there's a line between a brand position and then going out and actually pissing people off or upsetting them. And uh, I, I kind of crossed that line in a recent newsletter. Um, you know, what I was putting together I thought was was quite clever, um, but it actually offended some people and uh, to the point that they, they cancelled my course. So that was a little bit of a learning curve for me that um, it's good to be to push the envelope and be a little bit provocative, but you don't want to, to marginalise people. Okay, so it, so if you had your time again, would you change that newsletter, or would you would you would you um, sort of write that person off as someone who wasn't necessarily a great match for your brand personality or your course, or yeah, would you change your your, your stance if you had your time again? Yeah, look, I, th- I would dial it back a little bit. Um, I think what you have to be comfortable doing, and what what I need to be more comfortable in doing, is. Um, marginalizing a few people. I'm, you don't want to try and please everybody because yeah. then you'll end up pleasing nobody. But um, I think that the mistake was that you can be a certain way after people get to know you and they can build up uh, some trust around your message and that they know that you're not some complete idiot or psychopath. So when you've got that credit in the bank, I think it's easier to, to push the envelope. Gosh, mixing my metaphors there, sorry. But there was no credit in the bank in this instance. Uh, she hadn't met me. She signed up to the course and uh, received something that she was offended by. And of course, you know, the response was to to stage left exit. Right. Okay. So, so this, I mean, to 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 bring the, some of the listeners up to speed, there us, you know, there's this provocative headlines like I know there's been the uh, the, the the cocaine edition, uh, the the self inflicted pain edition, and the and the porn edition of your. Of your newsletter, and, <laughs> yes. and and me as somebody who knows you, they're provocative headlines. They um, deliberately provocative, and then you explain in the actual email newsletter itself the exact you know correlation between say cocaine or or self inflicted pain or, or porn, and how that ties into social media or, or web marketing. And I think it's been done in a very in a very clever way, in a very you know informative way as well. And uh, in, a, in a way that actually reflects your personality. Um, yes, it's, it is quite provocative, and, and that's really the part that I've admired how you've decided to put yourself out there and do that, and I, I guess I would, I would imagine it, it wins over many more fans than, than those people that it offends, but I guess it is always a fine line deciding exactly the path to tread. Yeah, and, and, and thanks for your, for your kind words. The... I guess some people would say that unless you are offending someone, you, you haven't found what that line is. Um, so, you know, it, it certainly wasn't a, a, a terminal 
crossing of the line, um, I was able to step back. But yeah, look, it's fun. And, and this is what I like about what I do in my business. And this is what I like about uh, online marketing, social media marketing generally is that whole personality driven aspect of it. Um, you can have a position, uh, you can um, be controversial, you can be funny, you can be mysterious. There's a lot of latitude uh, in terms of being um, somebody that's a little bit different than the guy to the left or the guy to the right. Yeah, sure, it's a good way to be memorable. And I mean, what I love about marketing too is that, you know, it's about expressing your personality and it's there's only one you and it's a hell of a lot easier to be the real you than to be a fake and to be bland and boring and put up these perceptions of, uh, you know, professionalism, which really often just translates to being bland, in, in my opinion. Um, so I'm pleased to see that you are flying the flag and, and, and putting yourself out there because I certainly gravitate towards your content and um, I hope... And I'm sure lots of other people do as well. Mm, thanks, Adam. Now, Tim, if you were starting from scratch, starting your web marketing from nothing, what would be the first thing that you did? Okay, it would be to roll my sleeves up and start to um, to build some owned online properties. And I guess that when I say owned, I mean things that you've got full control of no one can take away from you. So uh, a website, but if you can't manage that, then a blog. Um, I would want to set those up myself, like as much as I could. Okay, so I, I understand the processes involved. Now, I'm not suggesting you go out and learn how to code and build a website from scratch, but you need to learn by doing and to start to build things and experiment online and have that direct interface with what you're doing is the best way to learn. And of course, with learning comes confidence, and with the confidence, you can start to push the uh, the boundaries of, of your comfort zone and, and start to experiment with the web. And I think it's that experimental phase that gets really interesting for people. Um, my perception is that a lot of people are still afraid of breaking something on the web. You know, that if you press something the wrong way or press it too hard, the whole thing's going to tip over. But you can't. You can't break the web. Um, I like the idea that people are constantly skilling themselves up by having hands-on exposure. They're, they're pulling levers and pressing buttons and, and twisting dials and they're working out how stuff works. Um, so my advice would be to, to set some stuff up that is yours, as I say, and um, and start publishing. Uh, now, it doesn't have to be profound and it may not find an instant audience, but get into that mode of, of thinking like a publisher. Um, and a website and a blog is a, is a perfect uh, publishing uh, vehicle or vehicles to do that. And the good thing about um, starting out too and, and getting rolling your sleeves up and getting your hands dirty and practicing publishing is the fact that, you know, you, you've got that safety of not having a very big audience at the start. So you can make mistakes, you can, you can trip over and you're not going to embarrass yourself because realistically in the first couple of blog posts, you won't really have too many people listening to you. But as you grow, you'll become better and that's when your audience will grow. So it really is quite a safe learning environment on the yeah. web and it's not nowhere near as scary as it might seem to someone who's never actually tried it before. Yeah, completely. Um, I, I see some people out there that are, are waiting to get their job or career break before they start this process and I say, you, you don't need to wait for that to happen and you can start now. I mean, you can go to blogger.com and you can set up a blog tonight for free and you can post your first post. Uh, it could be a project based around, you know, your local community group or, you know, for your partner who's got a gym business or, or just yourself as a personal brand. But you don't have to wait for permission, I guess. That's such a good point. And I actually find that if, if, you, if you start these things, then you get your career break after it's already started, not the other way around. So it's kind of, uh, you know, focus on this first and then the opportunities will come afterwards. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, build, build a platform, I guess, uh, in summary. Now, Tim, part three of the podcast is where we dive deep into one specific area. Now, my question to you is what specific web marketing tactic brings you the most joy? Mm. I would say that it's the one that I find the most difficult to do, um, and that's the blog. Um, I do like writing. I'm not a particularly fast writer, so I find for me to get a blog post out uh, takes probably two to three hours which is incredible when you think about it. It's really, really slow. Um, but I love the finished product. I, I love, you know, finding the image to, to head the post. Um, I love uh, polishing uh, the paragraphs. I love hitting that, that 
publish button and have it go out there. And then, of course, it gets picked up by search straight away. Um, people who are subscribed to the blog uh, read it. I can see that on my live analytics as people uh, jump across and start consuming it. Um, and that, that to me is really, really satisfying. Now, can we just dive a little bit deeper here, Tim? And would you mind maybe taking us through the exact process that you go through for these two to three hours? Like, is there a research phase and then a writing and a polishing? What does it actually look like for you? Uh, look, I, I pretty much shoot from the hip. It's, it's whatever I'm in the mood uh, to create. Now, I know some more disciplined bloggers uh, have a, uh, you know, an editorial or a publishing schedule. Um, I don't tend to do that. Um, I, I just get an idea in my head and I'm in the mood to write. Uh, so uh, I, I do that. Um, but, you know, there's the, so many upsides to writing. It doesn't matter where you publish, but that process of writing, as you all know, with you, your book coming out shortly, um, it crystallizes the ideas in your head. You know, you have to be able to articulate what you're thinking in a way that the third party can understand. And, of course, that helps, you know, in future circumstances when you're presenting to other people uh, in courses, as I do. Um, but beyond that, I think it's the, the fact that you've got content out on the web and, and uh, people can reference it, determine your credibility. So it's, it's a nice, you know, subject matter expertise or thought leadership play. Um, but it's just the discipline to do it. And I think that's the hardest thing. I try and put out one a week. Um, but as I said, I'm the sort of guy that publishes, you know, when I'm in the mood. And uh, thank God I don't work for somebody else because I wouldn't be able to crank a, a blog post out on demand, I don't think. Well, I'm, I'm of the same opinion. You need to, you need to if in, when inspiration strikes, you need to make the most of that. And it's very rarely uh, during business hours and it's very rarely, stri- inspiration rarely strikes according to the plan you may have for it. And I often find I'm writing blog posts late at night or I get ideas early in the morning or out on a run, you know, always times when I'm not at my computer. Yeah, and, of course. And um, <laughs> I find, you know, using tools like Evernote to jot ideas down um, is really effective as well. But, yeah, you can't always be in the in the zone for writing, I guess, and it's it's – to get one out a week, I think is a is a big effort. Yeah, sometimes I fall off the fall off the wagon, but uh, you know, so far this year I've been able to put out one a week. And Tim, have you got any really effective pro tips for the more advanced listeners? Ooh, pro tips. Um, I'm quite interested, and I, I, I want to explore this more myself in terms of repurposing content. Now, you can do it to a minor extent. Um, you know, it's easy to take a an image, text on image quote that I may have put through Facebook or whatever and repurpose it onto, onto Pinterest, for example. But I'm more interested in building up a repository of, of content that I can sit down and start to really create some other format. So to take the blog posts and put them together, you know, into an ebook format. Um, to take some of my blog posts and um, put them into video format. It could be me not so much reading them word for word, but restyling them. And, you know, this comes down to the fact that I've got limited hours in, in my week. I mean, I, I, I'm totally on board with the idea of producing content, quality content, and pushing it out on a regular basis. But, gosh, it's a big ask to do that day in, day out. So I'm, I'm trying to get smarter as to how I produce the content and how I can leverage it in different ways. That's a great tip because I think a lot of people prefer to consume, for lack of a better word, their content in different ways. Like I know we've spoken in the past about you love listening to books as audio books, and I do too when I, when I go out for a run or I'm commuting somewhere. And some people, I've actually done a couple of video interviews um, with yourself included, but my series of video interviews I've actually found aren't as popular as when I take the transcription of that exact same interview and put it into or repurpose it into an ebook format. Mm. Like the ebook yep. format is just significantly more popular, and I don't know why, but you know, it's 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 at the end of the day, it's more people who are interacting with your content, which is which is a good thing. Yeah, it's easy to get locked into one um, content. Uh, uh, medium. Uh, I mean, text is the obvious one for people to publish through their websites and blogs, but um, audio and video, um, I, I think, is still largely overlooked by many organisations. I totally agree. And audio and video is going to be the big push from me this year as well. Yeah. So the podcast that we're obviously recording uh, at the moment, you, you, this is your podcast. I've got my own podcast. Um, I, I find that uh, there's been a lot of fun up till now. 
And of course, I think it opens up. Up until different... this podcast you're doing with me now, Tim. Well, it's yeah, downhill <laughs> from, from this point, but uh, up until this point, it was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's just taking into account that different people like to consume different media in different ways. And, you know, I, I, I find it very efficient to listen to podcasts and audiobooks because I do a lot of, uh, a lot of walking. So I'm, I'm doing two things at once. I probably wouldn't deep dive to the extent of having to read the, the equivalent length uh, podcast in the blog format, for example. Yeah, and then also the flip side of that too is that it's, all, it's also, for some people, a lot easier to talk for half an hour than it is to actually, you know, put pen to paper or put fingers to keyboards and actually produce a blog post. So, you know, in terms of ease of content creation, audio and video can be a lot a lot uh, more fun and a lot easier as well. Yeah, v- video is another, you know, one that, uh, you know, once you've got the kit, you've got a $300 HD camera and a $25 tripod and a $25 external mic, you're good for go. And, you know, you've got your own little you know, mini uh, television studio that you can start, uh, you know, creating that video content. And, and people like video. They, they're they quite happy to hit the play button and watch a video for three or four minutes. And there's a huge amount of information you can uh, transfer in that small amount of time. Absolutely. Now, Tim, part four of the podcast is um, is where we look at what you've learned from other people. And I personally know some of the bloggers and, and, and whatnot that you follow. But would you mind sharing with our listeners who you've learnt from, whether it's in person or via their via their books or their blogs? Look, I I continue to be inspired by the likes of uh, Seth Godin um, on a number of levels. I, I find his words encouraging, uh, but also am very impressed with the uh, the persistence and the consistency that he's able to produce. And I think it's it's anyone that that starts a journey and there are going to be moments where they waver on it, there's self doubt, they go into a trough or whatever, but they keep they keep pushing forward. Um, I like the idea online that you launch before you're ready, so not to wait for that perfect moment that. You know, everything is lined up and you can hit the button and there's the grand, you know, opening and the curtains pull back. As Seth would say, ship, ship it, get stuff out and iterate on it quickly. And that's been sort of my guiding philosophy for, for the last three or four years. And everything that I've done is to really push myself to, to put stuff out there and then work on it once it's out in the wild. It's quite confronting, isn't it, trying to put, well, just firstly putting stuff out into the marketplace, whether it's a podcast or a blog or, or anything for that matter, because you're opening yourself up for, for, for being judged and being criticised and everything. And I know Seth Godin refers to that as the resistance or the lizard brain kicking in. How do you overcome that you know, fear of people not liking it or um, leaving negative comments or judging you? <laughs> Look, I, I'm getting better and better at that. I, I would say if I went back a few years, um, I was quite sensitive to the uh, opinions and views of others. Uh, I don't know whether this is part of me getting older or it's just more confidence on the on the web or whatever, but I, I, I'm not looking for validation from uh, other people as much as I used to. So I'm, I'm happy to put stuff out there. I, I know stuff that I personally don't like that I've done and stuff that I really like what I've done. And I, I'm probably comfortable to to have my own sort of internal uh, compass uh, guide me in that respect and not be so sensitive to, to what other people are saying. And are there any particular books, say by Seth or by anybody else that you'd particularly like to recommend or that have really impacted your marketing journey? Yeah, oh, the marketing journey. Um, look, I've, I've got a bunch of books that, that I could rattle off. I, I read a lot, but I'm actually finding inspiration from non-marketing books. So I'm, I'm pushing myself to, to more and more uh, listen to fiction. And I, I, I think there's great little insights in terms of um, – ways people communicate and, and the subtleties of, of social interaction and engagement that have nothing to do with business or social media, but it's just the interplay between two parties, and, and which is why I like fiction so much. So I do get good inspiration from that. There's one book in particular, and it's not really a marketing book, but it, it kind of rocked me on my heels when I read it uh, this last summer, which was um, The Master Switch by Tim Wu. Um, and this, uh, this talks to the idea of, of who controls uh, the, um, the, the, 
the different points of a value chain. So in the internet, for example, who, who are the content uh, controllers? Who are the who controls the pipes? You know where the data flows through the internet, and who controls the devices which um, uh, content is consumed through? And it's made me look at the internet in a very very different way. Um, I actually thought the internet was this big monolith, stable beast. Um, but I actually think it's a lot more fragile than, than people uh, believe. And we take it for granted that we can just set up our own businesses online and connect with people through pipes. But um, it's not to say it will always be that way. And uh, again, Tim Wu's the master switch. If you <laughs> want a little insight as to, to what an alternate reality could be like on the, on the web, um, take a read. Thanks for that uh, recommendation there, Tim. And um, are there any closing thoughts or final pieces of advice you'd like to share with our listeners? Uh, look, it's a journey. I, I think we're all on the journey. I, I think there's a tendency for us to think that other people are further ahead than us. In fact, that everybody is further ahead uh, in their understanding as to how the internet works and social works, but that's not the case. Most of us, you and I included, Adam, uh, are bumbling our way through. Um, we've probably got a little more structure than somebody coming into it for the, for the first time. But it's moving so quickly and it's changing so quickly and the, and the underlying rules don't change, but the rest of it's changing all the time. And, and I would say jump right in. There's no better time to do it than now. Get that hands-on experience. Learn by doing and be comfortable that you'll never arrive, that it's, it's the journey. And, that, and that's the fun of the whole thing. That's awesome. That's, that's, it's really true because no matter how far you are through the journey, there's always someone further ahead. There's always someone further behind. And as long as you're moving forwards and you're enjoying it, then I think that's the most important thing. Pretty much. And this is a fun space for sure. It is a lot of fun. Now, Tim, finally, um, you're a wine buff. I've got two questions for you. One, <laughs> what, what wine can you recommend to our listeners? And then finally, how can people connect with you? Oh, gosh, you didn't warn me that you're going to ask me that. No, that's a spot question. Yeah, gosh, I have to think. I'm a, a big fan of Pinot Noir. I used to work in the wine industry and, uh, and Pinot, whether it be uh, locally grown or, or from Burgundy, I'm a big, big fan of. So um, I love su- some of the stuff coming out of Central Targo uh, in New Zealand, uh, especially. Um, expect to pay decent money for it, but that's the thing with, with Pinot. Um, what was the next question? Next again? question is how can our listeners connect with you? Oh, right. That's easy. Okay. So uh, my training organization, Net101, uh, can be found at netnet101.com.au. Uh, my Twitter handle is at 2 sticks digital, the number two. Um, so that's probably the easiest way to connect with me. And uh, over and above, of course, uh, sitting down and having a coffee, which I'm uh, always a big fan of doing. Fantastic. Well, any listeners in Melbourne, Tim is uh, is easily contactable and no doubt would love to sit down for a coffee or maybe a uh, glass of Pinot. Tim, thank you so much for joining us and all the best with your marketing journey and thanks for sharing everything that you have with us today. Great. Thanks, Adam. Pleasure. And now we have another interesting chat with our guest, Tim Martin from Net101. Really interesting, I thought, that he shared with us that story of actually having losing a customer or having one of his attendees who had prepaid for a ticket ask for a refund because of something that he'd written on his email newsletter. And it kind of got me thinking, you know, what would we do in a similar situation? And it was a difficult one, hey, Tobes? Yeah, it is a bit of a difficult one, Ads, because I think... You know, every audience is different and as you sort of mentioned right back at the start, you know, every, you know, every person is different too with um, their style and their humor and what have you and it's pretty hard to, I, I think that's just such a big component of what people sort of subscribe, you know, literally or figuratively to um, with your marketing and, the, and your style of content that you do share that it's pretty hard to separate. Um, what, what are your thoughts there, Ads? It's, it is tough because you certainly don't want to be losing business or you don't think you want to be losing business. But if I, I think if you, if you pander to the vocal minority and, it's, and, that sort of, and that's compromising and if that compromises your, pers- your personal values and your company values, like if that's your personality and if that's your sense of humor and that's what you stand for, then there are going to be people who don't agree with you or don't like you or just have difference a difference of opinion 
And I think at the end of the day, the more I think about it, the more I think we've just got to be comfortable letting them go and letting them find, you know, someone else to get their information from. And even though it's quite a confronting thought, you know, having paying customers or a paying customer leave, I do think that if you stay true to your personality and your sense of humour and your values, then that really is the way to the way to go. Yeah, and I mean, you know, obviously you can't if you're trying to be everything to everyone, then then you're nothing to anyone. Um, you know, that really rings true in this sort of scenario. And I guess there is some initial, you know, there is a little bit of pain in terms of sticking with who you are. Um, but like we, you know, we don't like everyone that we meet. Um, I think it's pretty similar in business that, uh, you know, that, that we do, you know, to, you really do have to be true to yourself. Um, and the sooner that you do that, you know, you'll figure out whether or not your audience likes that or not. Um, and maybe it's time for a new audience or, um, you know, or perhaps a fresh approach, but ultimately, you know, it's pretty hard to remove yourself from the equation without removing you know one of the things that can actually be unique about your product or service or communication or anything else yeah i mean i've certainly gravitated towards tim martin's uh style and just an example of that is his uh on april the first this year he posted one of his new courses that he's running it's called telephone essentials for business and it says it's following on from his popular photocopying for success workshop he says uh, 97 percent of australian businesses use or would consider using a telephone to to contact their preferred business yet many have not confidently embraced the technology Th things that he covers in the workshop is um you know building the business case internally for the telephone <laughs> whilst it not may whilst it may not be fully understood by senior management what the benefits of a telephone are tim will present compelling case studies from the commercial government and not for profit sectors about where telephones have been successfully introduced he also hmm. he also talks about countering encountering the common objections to installing a telephone in your workplace the common objections how will we quantify the return and he says, whilst there is no fixed ROI formula, there are many ways to calculate um, the ROI of a telephone. <laughs> so he really does uh, go into other things that you cover in the course, telephone etiquette. What do you do when people call you? What if you've never met this person before? What, <laughs> what do you, uh, where we go? A answering a phone call without knowing who's calling in. I'm um, working out the order in which the two of you should talk. Uh, and so obviously it's written um, as a bit of a, satir a satirical piece, but it and, and, and it does actually highlight, you know, how funny our objections to social media are because at the end of the day, it's just a communication tool. What we do with it is exactly the same as, you know, how we use a telephone or an, or an email address. But, um, you know, his quirky sense of humour is, is funny, in my opinion, and it may not appeal to everybody. But those sorts of things that Tim publishes, I find really amusing. He has a video that goes with it. Um, and so, you know, it's drawn me towards Tim's business. We've certainly referred um, many people to his courses. And I, I do think it's a great example of Tim's personality shining through, and I'm sure that he'll attract a heap more people than, um, you know, the odd person that, that, that takes offence and decides to go somewhere else. Yeah, that's really true, isn't it? I mean, um, you know, for everyone or potentially vocal one that does go elsewhere, you've got to wonder how much, how much you know, that personality weighs into the buying decision when someone does decide to buy it, you know, out of the other 19 people in the course or however many it was. It'd be really interesting to know how many were attracted to his personality. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think it would be the vast majority. Mm. Well, we'll put a we'll put a link to his telephone for biz, telephone essentials for business uh, course in the show notes, and we might also try and embed his video of him explaining with a deadpan face exactly why we should consider his telephone course. <laughs> 
Oh, well, as always, this show is happily brought to you by Web Marketing That Works, the book, and specifically the bonus 33 free templates that go with it. Um, if you're keen to download those, jump over to bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book. And we are trying to deliver actionable advice at every step of these shows. So please, we welcome your feedback and your questions. Let us know via email or Twitter. My email is toby.jenkins at bluewiremedia.com.au or on Twitter at toby underscore Jenkins. Okay, and I am contactable at adam.franklin at bluewiremedia.com.au as well as on Twitter, I am at franklin underscore adam. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the show. Toby and I truly appreciate it. And if you did enjoy the show, we would love it if you could leave an honest review on iTunes and we will give a shout out and probably a mention in the show notes to the lovely listeners that leave us a five-star review. So thanks again for tuning in and we look forward to speaking with you next time. Thanks again, everyone.